So if you want to know if you're getting ahead or behind, you want to look at income and economic expansion, those two things, versus credit expansion. And that tells you whether or not people are actually making more, they're being more productive and keeping more of their money, or whether we're just simply putting it on the credit card and saying, charge it, let me have it now, I'll pay for it never. The problem with the latter is that eventually you hit the wall on acceptance. People either can't take out more loans or nobody believes that they're going to pay and they won't give them more loans. And it doesn't matter which it is. You need both willing and able borrowers in order to continue that cycle. That's how we got in trouble in 2007 because we had a couple little hedge funds that blew up. Remember the whole the Bear Stearns uh, thing back in, uh, in 2007? Two little teeny tiny hedge funds went boom and people sat up and said, hmm, I don't think these guys are going to pay their mortgages. And the entire world came apart on that expectation. Now we've blown an even bigger credit bubble, but it's not centered in houses now, although it's starting to show up there again. It's in student loans. It's in car loans. It's in credit card debt. It's everywhere across the economy. And, and most dangerously, compared to what we had before, it's also in corporate finance and the engineering of balance sheets to pay dividends and buy back stock. You know, buying back stock with borrowed money sounds great as long as the price keeps going up. But what happens when you pay $400 a share for your stock as a corporation and then six months later it trades for $200? You paid four, right? Yeah. You flush $200 a share down the toilet. And that money has to be paid with interest out of future earnings. So, you know, to do it out of capital that you retained because you made the money, is in some cases defensible. Where it's not defensible is when you borrow the money because if your stock price does not continue to accelerate to the upside, then you have not only the loss of interest that you have to pay on the borrowed money, you have a capital loss on the acquisition of the shares that you put into the treasury. Nobody counts for that possibility. So essentially you're making a bet on the calm that that's not going to happen. Well, that's a nice sentiment. Uh, gee, what goes up never comes down. You know, and what you're painting the picture is that we have a similar setup to 2007, only worse. Is that right? It's broader, but less sharp. Okay, that's the way I would look at it. The, the 2007 collapse happened because of de derivative exposure that was uncapitalized. And when that became, I mean, look at what happened to AIG. AIG wrote right. nearly a trillion dollars worth of derivatives with something like, what was it, 50 billion in capital or some stupid amount of, you know, essentially zero for all intents and purposes, right? Yeah. You know, 200 to one leverage. Fannie and Freddie were geared 80 to one. Um, and, and as soon as that got exposed, even though it was a huge part of the economy, in dollar terms, it wasn't that large an amount of money. All right. And now? But because of the amount of leverage that was implicit there and the fact that people can claim on those notional when, you know, look, if I, if, if I bought an insurance policy from you and said, you're going to pay me $10,000 if this thing defaults, if it defaults, you owe me 10 grand. Now. <laughs> All right. Here's your defaulted bond. Give me my money. And then you get to go try to recover whatever you can off the defaulted instrument, which could be anything from zero to some percentage of the face. Well, if you don't have the, the $10,000, <laughs> OK, <laughs> you know, because you have to be able to give it to me now and then go back and try to collect. That's what blew up the world. What's happening now is much more diffuse. It's much wider because it's across both personal balance sheets and more importantly, corporate balance sheets. But it's not as sharp. So I don't expect the same kind of disaster that we had with compounding, cascading failures. The danger is, is that. I'm not at all sure that that's not true outside the United States. In other words, I don't see that kind of point source risk in the U.S. Where I think it's very possibly present, though, is in Japan and China, as well as a number of other emerging markets. And either one of those countries could take us down. Could take the whole. Well, world. if the, yeah, if if it happens overseas, it will come here because the interlocking connections between institutions. Have, have not been decoupled at all, and the too-big-to-fail paradigm is still present, and we still have a crazy amount of exposure over there. So I, you know, I don't think that the, ri the risk is diffuse but more severe in the United States. It, the point source kind of risks are overseas at this point. And by the way, they're in Europe as well. So, you know, there's a possibility that, that the triggering event comes from over in Europe, although, I, frankly, I think it comes out of Asia.